Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the voice of professional wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. And today, we're going to be watching a historic episode of Monday Night Raw. It went down October 21st, 1996. And perhaps this episode is most remembered for Bret Hart's long awaited return to the World Wrestling Federation. It'll be the first time we've seen Bret on WWE programming since WrestleMania 12. We'll also be talking about the first ever live raw on TSN, which was certainly a big opportunity in Canada, how Bret Hart's negotiations went with WCW and how ultimately Vince landed the big fish that is Bret the Hitman Hart. We'll talk about Mr. Perfect, the feud with Steve Austin that Bret was about to embark on and so much more. It's a special look back at one of my favorite times in WWE history. I just love 96, 97. I'm getting back into wrestling and man, this is just a good old nostalgia and who better to watch one of these shows back with than our buddy JR. It's a remix here on grilling JR from when we watched raw from October 21st, 1996, right here on grilling JR. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. And you're listening to grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross, Jim, how are you, man? I'm good. Connie better than I probably deserve to be glad to see you. You're doing bright and cheerful and healthy. And, uh, but things are good here, man. I'm, I'm back, I'm back down in, uh, Jacksonville beach. So it's hard to complain about my surroundings. Weather's good. Living on the beach is nice. I'm very blessed. I'm even more blessed. We have a great audience that are, that are joining us here today. And, uh, it's going to be a good show. This is going to be a fun show. A little, a little, right. A little watch along. I kind of have fun with these things and, but we've got a lot of other things to talk about too, right? We do indeed. First, let's start right at the, uh, top of the, the deal here this past week. You went to NYC, the big comic con, man, that tells you things are getting back to normal, right? Jim Ross at the comic con. Yeah. You know, I've, I've turned down more offers than I received seemingly. And I just kind of backed off of it, especially during the COVID business, uh, all the restrictions and the, and the issues and so forth. So I, I love doing them. I love doing comic cons and I love making these appearances and talking to the fans and so forth, but because of the COVID and all those things, I kind of backed away a little bit. So, uh, but it was first class, big time. It's exactly what you'd have thought a New York city comic con would be highly organized, a lot of traffic. And I'm really glad that I took that opportunity. So I want to, I appreciate the folks at the, uh, New York city comic con. Hopefully we can, I think we're going to try to do some more business here and there. The gentleman that brought me in owns, uh, a bunch of memorabilia stores. So, uh, if schedules work out going forward, I'll be doing a few more of them and I, and, and I enjoy it. I'm glad that we're th- at that point in the game that we can still go out and do those things. No doubt about it. It's, uh, it's fun just to have an opportunity to go out and meet some of your favorite folks. And of course, uh, Tony Schiavone was a big part of comic con. Uh, he's he got, the house. he's he got his house. new graphic novel. Uh, Jim, what's your favorite graphic novel? Uh, I was a teenage werewolf. Really? I, no, I don't have a fucking clue. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, right now it's Tony's. It's, it's rapidly moved up the charts. Number one with a bullet actually doing very well. Seriously. Yeah. It's the number yeah. one, uh, on Amazon, I think. And you can yeah. find out more about it over at butts and seats, comic.com. But man, uh, Tony Schiavone. He's had a little bit of a resurgence here. Has he not? I mean, back on TV. Yeah. Now he's got a comic book. We got to stop this dude. What the hell? <laughs> he's a, uh, he's gone a long way from that barista days. Yeah, I would say so. I still think that's one of the most, uh, uh memorable sequences of dialogue when, uh, Britt Baker called him out on being a barista working at Starbucks. And, uh, I thought that was just, they, they were classic. He's. He and she have a great re- timing, great rapport. I think it's kind of fun, but nonetheless, I congratulate Tony and his whole team for the success that they're having. And folks, you get a chance, you know, check it out, at least check it out for God's sakes. And you might enjoy it. They put a lot of work in it. And I think it looks pretty damn entertaining. Now, without question, Dirk Manning and his crew have done a great job for Tony. It's butts and seats, 
I want to also mention that, man, you're like in full swing of things back on the road, you know, Philadelphia, New York city, you're hitting all your old towns again, because AEW is back working in front of, uh, seemingly full houses and boy, in the more recent weeks, there's been a ton of debate about WWE drawing versus AEW and WWE guys were saying, well, the tickets cost more. And hey, here's my thing. <laughs> I don't really care to compare sort of a versus B as much as I do say, man, what a healthy sign for wrestling fans and the wrestling right. business that we've now got two promotions doing pretty good business. Yeah. I think that's good for pro wrestling period. And not to, I'm not going to overanalyze it. I'm not going to analyze their, uh, ticket prices or any of that shit. It's no. just, that's just, why can't we all just be happy that, that the, our business is good. There you go. Cause that's, that's what matters. I mean, the healthier pro wrestling is the healthier, uh, grill and JR is going to be, it's a trickle down. Yeah. We all share in the success of our, of our, of our business. And I'm really glad that we're at that, that stage. Now, who the hell would have thought, you know, two weeks, two weeks, two years ago that we'd be talking about it in these terms. Cause all of a sudden AEW has become very, very relevant. And, uh, you know, that's, I, I believe that's all due to Tony Khan's, uh, uh, opening up the checkbook and, and signing some of the best talents in the world. And I don't say that and a knock to the other guys, what people, wrestling fans take it though, for God's sakes, JR is knocking the WWE again. How can he do that? He was there 26 years. He made a lot of money. He had a, his legacies there. He's in their hall of fame. I'm not knocking them. All I'm saying is, is that. Two years ago, when AEW started its journey, I don't think any of us, including me, perceived that it would grow to the level that it has, it has grown in this length of time. It's pretty astonishing. So the, the winners of all this are the fans, and, but some fans just, uh, don't want to, they're just, they don't have that. They don't have that mindset. And I think that's a sad state of affairs. We've battled for years and years, Conrad, to be acknowledged by the public pro wrestling. It's a carny business. It's that, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, slap and go it's a grunt and groan. Nobody wants to cover it. And now everybody wants to cover it. And our own people, our own fan base, some, in some degree are bitching about it. And I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why I just don't get it. Well, it's because we're loyal to WWE all those years, you know, I go on TV or on this, uh, on our, on our podcast say, I thought that our last pay-per-view was one of the best pay-per-views. It's not the best that I'd worked in years and years, or maybe forever. That was my opinion, but I got castigated over it, castrated too. And the man don't want to lose his balls. Right. So, uh, I don't, I don't understand it, but in any event, I want to enjoy the ride, man. I'm going to enjoy going to work. I'm going to enjoy the whole, whole thing. And, and, uh, count my blessings that I'm here at the right place at the right time once again. And, uh, here we are. So I'm, I'm happy. I hope everybody else can be happy today. Well, we're going to be happy because we're going to be doing a watch along from 1996. And that's always fun to go back and take a look at these old shows. And if I'm honest with you, Jim, I think the, the whole point of our, our show is nostalgia, right? We want to go back and remember the way things were. And a lot of us listen to the music that like our parents used to make us listen to the music that they listen to. And right. now we find ourselves doing that. Like I'm listening to Nirvana and Metallica, and I'm sure my kids are thinking the same thing. Like dad, we got to listen to the new stuff. So we're going to do that today and help everybody go back to their childhood 25 years ago. Well, not you, Jim, well, you were a grown man. Anyway, I was uh, grown up <laughs> 1996, man. What an important year for professional wrestling. Of course, the NWO became a thing. Stone Cold Steve Austin dropped that infamous now Austin 316 promo, but there really felt like competition for Vince McMahon on the World Wrestling Federation for years and years. Uh, even going back to 87, 88, 89, 90, all the way through to 1996, WCW slash the NWA before them was really like Vince McMahon's little brother in this more modern era of wrestling, <laughs> they yeah. just stood no chance, but for the first time now there's real competition in 96 and people over the years have said Vince does better with competition. Yeah. Would you agree with that? 
I think so. It motivates him. He didn't like to lose. And I think the, uh, battle on Wednesday nights is indicative of that statement. That's why they moved to Tuesday. He didn't like getting his ass beat every Wednesday night. And I know we didn't win every Wednesday night. I get that folks, but we won most of them and winning one is too many for him. So he's very competitive. He believes he owns the genre. Uh, you know, he is the godfather, like you are the pod father and I get it. I understand it. And I, I, I respect and appreciate his, his, uh, co- uh, competitiveness, but, uh, yeah, he works better when there's a little pressure on him. And I think that's been proven time and time again. So, uh, he's, a he's a different breed of cat when it comes to that stuff and reading on Thursdays, who got this audience and this got this, this show got that audience. I can promise you was an issue. Uh, just was, it was definitely an issue without question. It's, uh, it's always been, I don't know, important to look back at the history of wrestling and, and just the history of all things, right. To sort of see what might happen in the future, help us predict what's going to happen in the future. And boy, this is one of those moments where I think people are going to draw a lot of parallels. Of course, we're talking about Bret Hart returning to, uh, to action. There'd been a lot of talk that, well, you know, Kevin Nash left and, you know, Scott Hall left and, you know, Sean Waltman left. It felt like all the momentum was on the WCW side of things. Do you think Vince McMahon felt like, well, if we lose Brett, that's too much. The idea being, I know people would say with Vince, he never sold anything. So when Hall leaves and Nash leaves and Waltman leaves, he's quote unquote, not selling it. Meaning he doesn't seem like he's gotten to, he's still confident. He's got the better product, but did he feel like perhaps Brett Hart leaving would have been too much? He may have, he may have, you know, he was very, at one time, Vince and Brett were very close and Brett was looked at as one of those homegrown guys. And anytime you're a promoter and one of your homegrown guys starts succeeding, uh, you feel a, a, a great sense of accomplishment. And, and I think that's kind of what Brent saw, Brett, uh, Vince saw with Brett, you know, Brett was known as a tag team guy and a real good one, but Vince saw that Brett could be a single star. And of course he was, so that was a good call. But then when all the rumbling started and the guaranteed monies were flying around and all these exorbitant, uh, and I don't say exorbitant, like they didn't deserve it. That's, uh, that's not true. That's not even accurate. JR, you dumb bastard, but it's just a matter of, you know, uh, it just, it, he, I think he was concerned and it, it gets a, it gets a bad look like we're losing traction and we're losing a foothold and, and things are changing too rapidly in a negative way. So, uh, I think keeping Brett was a high, of great importance and not just for the per- appearance. Uh, a guy leaving and going to the competition. I mean, let's face it, Conrad, Bret Hart was one of the greatest workers ever. Yeah. And he was in his prime. Yeah. And, and, uh, so you don't want to lose a guy like that, no matter the political s- surroundings. So I think, uh, Brett was a high priority. You know, I came there in 93. So I, I only knew Brett from television at that point. I never, I never got around him he was always in WWE and I was never in WWE at that time. So, uh, our relationship grew as time went on and to, to this very day, we're great friends and we, we communicate from time to time. And, you know, he knows I'm here to help him out if I can on some of his projects. And, uh, and I do, and, uh, he's always been friendly to me and very complimentary of my work. Uh, you know, it's amazing what he remembers about matches I've called, uh, you mentioned, uh, Sean Waltman. You know, uh, Sean Waltman and Brett had a, had a, had a run or two and, and on TV and that really helped make Sean Waltman's career. And I was lucky enough to be sitting in that chair at that point in time to broadcast it. So I have a lot, I have a lot of time for Brett and, but I think Vince looked at it in two ways uh, from a, I think, first of all, probably the personal way I can't lose Brett. You know, he was one of my staples. He's like, he's homegrown. He's home developed, but also the fact that I just mentioned He's a hell of a worker Yeah, and you, you can't keep losing hell of a workers and think you're going to replace them, uh, easily. It just doesn't happen. So we know ultimately he's going to land here with the WWF and we're going to talk about that. And we're actually going to listen to some of that in ring segment, but before we get going, I wanted to bring this up because 
gosh, at this point, it's years ago. I had a conversation with Eric Bischoff on our sister podcast, 83 weeks. And we talked right. about Bret Hart in WCW, but we also talked about this era in 1996, where it felt like Brett was maybe the hottest free agent in the history of wrestling at that point. And really it felt like before that, maybe Brian Pillman was one of those, but now it was Brett's turn. And for years and years, it's been said that Brett had a big time offer from WCW and Vince was up against it. Vince couldn't match the money, but he did offer longevity and perhaps Brett was loyal and saw a 20 year opportunity with a guy he had been with for a long time versus a quick cash grab from someone who he didn't have a lot of history with. Correct. And Eric says didn't happen. Never made him an offer. Huh? What do you make of that? Uh, I'm surprised. I, I, and I'm not doubting Eric's word cause he was there and I was not. So, but I, I find it hard to believe that he did that Brett didn't get an offer to at least, uh, let him smell some of that big money. You know, it may have been, t- may have been discussed in a roundabout way and not a direct offer. I don't know, Connie, but that surprises me quite frankly. I, us too. You know, I had built the entire show around talking about the ins and outs of that contract because allegedly. It was going to include some movie work because we know that Brett at the time had an interest in doing those type of, uh, opportunities. You know, he had done lonesome dove and a few other things. And I think the talk was perhaps he would get a hefty sum from the Turner side of things and do some TNT movies and also have the biggest wrestling contract at the time. I think that anybody had maybe outside of Hogan, uh, but still Eric drew a line in the sand, even though. Uh, Dave Meltzer and a lot of other folks said, no, it definitely happened. I saw the contract, (laughs) Eric doubled down and said, if you find that contract, I'll eat it. Uh, and all these years later, (laughs) nobody has found it. Do you believe, and I realize I'm just dropping all this on you cold, but do you believe this becomes one of those wrestling lore things where it's, you know, it's just repeated often enough that that becomes fact, because even after Eric has maybe been the only voice saying it didn't happen because no one believed him. And everyone said, yes, it definitely happened. No one produced the contract, which I found odd. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm surprised that Eric said that, but I'm not doubting his word because, you know, like I said, he was there. I was not right. Eric's not a guy that likes to cover his ass. He'll tell you like it is. Yeah. And I appreciate with Eric. I appreciate that with him, uh, and respect him for, for that. Cause that's not a common trait with wrestling promoters to speak your mind and to fall on your sword and be honest. Uh, so he was, uh, certainly that way. And, and, uh, since I've been dealing with him uh, and, you know, even when he came to work for us in WWE at the time, but, uh, it's surprising. It's a surprising development. I just got to believe that somewhere along the way, money's generally speaking, generally discussing income. Cause let's be honest about it. It's all about cash and creative. Of course. And Eric's going to probably make sure that Brett has the same, uh, creative, uh, uh, control that he, that he had with some of his other guys. Cause they talk, uh, those guys talk and you can bet your ass. They were talking to Brett. Here's what the deal we got. Here's our deal creative, you know, so, and then cash and creative. So, uh, I don't know how that could have not have had been a part of a conversation, but making a firm offer is a different ball game. So, uh, and that, that was, that was a good gift for those guys. And I, I just think that it comes down to a lot of these things. A lot of things come down to this. I should say communication. Oh yeah. I mean, God dang, a lot of these issues that we talk about on this show could have been prevented if, uh, if talents and the decision makers were communicating in an upfront and, and a and sincere and genuine way. That's not always the case as we know. Uh, so I don't know, man, I just think this poor communication causes a lot of these issues, which is bullshit because what happens is the almighty wrestling ego business gets, gets interjected and that becomes a catalyst. And what you're talking about is ego. And that's kind of what it was. You know, Brett felt he had great worth. He felt like that, you know, he. He should have been paid more 
And I don't doubt, I'm not disagreeing with that, quite frankly. You know, he should have been the highest paid guy in WWE by far. He was the most valuable player of WWE at that time by far. So I don't, to me, it was not a hard decision, but also I'm not looking at the books. I'm not looking at Vince's accounting and so forth and so on, but losing Brett was a, would have been a big hit on the live events. And even though today live events are not a, are not a huge consequence, it seems like because of the rights fees and so forth and the promotions getting their money in a different source. Uh, Brett was always that staple that drew houses. He was big on the live event, uh, tours and sold tickets and made money for the company. So he was, a uh, he, he, he offered a lot. And the other thing that people don't see Conrad, and you know, I've been, I'm a big proponent of this. I believe you should recruit athletes. I believe that you should treat talents like athletes, not entertainers. Uh, I believe that we should dress in locker rooms, not dressing rooms. I'm an old school bastard. I get it. I get it folks. Uh, but I, Brett covered all those bases and what he did in the locker room. I don't know of any talent that I ever worked with that had more respect from his peers in that locker room than Bret Hart. So he influenced a lot of young talents. He talked to them about work ethic and fundamental soundness and things like that. So he was invaluable in that era because he certainly was a believable and, uh, a very, uh, you know, trustworthy guy. So, uh, that that's, and I don't, I don't know how you put a dollar price on that. And I don't know that WW, WCW at that time had an abundance of individuals that would put the, the company or the other talents ahead of their, of, of themselves. I think Bret Hart had that, that ability. And I think he did it on a regular basis. We should also mention that, um, there's a story brewing behind the scenes on this head to head battle of the WWF and WCW the prior week on raw, the show did a 1.78 rating. That's the lowest rating in the show's history at that point. And everyone points to the raw from Europe in 97 as sort of the wake up call for Vince Russo and the attitude era beginning, but coming off of a pay-per-view like we are here in 96 and we're, we're coming off of buried alive and having a record low rating. Vince has to be fired up and ready for a change. Do you remember Brett being, well, let's pause the Brett talk for a minute. Do you remember Vince being, I don't know, open to new ideas? Will that be fair to say? Sure. Absolutely. He was very open to new ideas. Uh, but the problems we were having had nothing to do with Brett Hart. Right. Cause he wasn't on the show. Yeah. It was just. Nothing. Uh, but as far as, so, you know, people t- give credit to the attitude era as saying, well, this, this changed everything. Right. And a lot of people try to point to when did that change happen? But he's trying new things here. He, now he's got Jim Ross turning heel and he's got the fake razor and diesel <laughs> and he's never really acknowledged the competition like this. And even though we're not necessarily beating you over the head with the fact that WCW could have gotten Bret Hart, we are sort of celebrating Hey, we kept him and that's acknowledged on TV. And it feels like Vince at this point, because a lot of people say these days, uh, when they complain about creative, oh, it's for an audience of one, the idea being that it's just Vince doing what Vince wants to do every single week. But do you think this is the era where perhaps people could get Vince's ear a little easier than they could at any other time? Yeah, he was, a, he was a, a, a uh, accepted accepting, uh, new thoughts, new ideas. He was listening to more people. Uh, and he, you know, you're up to, you got to try new things to see what might get over. Right. And, and we were, we just didn't have the right players on the field. You know, uh, the attitude era was an era that, you know, we were challenged, especially in my area of talent relations to sign more younger guys, sign more guys who are hungry, athletic, uh, that wanted to be stars. Stone Cold is a great example of that. You know, he was a journeyman. When he came there, he was going to be a journeyman heel managed by Ted DiBiase. And then all of a sudden through Steve's, uh, uh, persona, he got over as a baby face. I remember I, the, one of the worst cussings he ever gave me was, uh, 
one night after raw, uh, was, was over. And I went back into the locker room area and, and uh, there he sat looking down to, at the floor, like he was looking for dimes. And uh, I said, uh, well, how's it feel to be a big baby face, man? I got an F U and S O B and you know, he, he was ripping my ass. I said, well, let me hold on a second. Cause I knew what motivated stone. Cold. Yeah. Money. I said, you know, uh, the money you can make simply on merch is astonishing. You'll make more money on merch than you've ever made with a wrestling contract. And he, he, he raised his head up off the floor and looked at me and he was searching for more info. I said, you're going to have quarters of income where you're going to make seven figures. And you know, I both know seven figures is a million dollars. That's a lot of t-shirts you might say, but you got to, your audience is growing by leaps and bounds every week. There's more posters every week. That, that's a great market research. People should, the promoters should look at the signs in the audience. I love it. When the AEW fans bring signs, it tells us what's on their mind, what they're thinking, what's, what, what has their interest at that point in time. Right. So he got over his hard on for being a baby face. And, uh, started accepting the role because becoming a baby face might not have been his preference. He wanted to be an old school heel. I said, your shelf life will be longer as this, this, uh, character baby face. That's what he was. He wasn't a Ricky steamboat, Ricky Morton kind of, kind of a baby face. He was a character baby face that didn't change his work style. Didn't change his, his holes, his mannerisms, his, uh, sequencing or nothing. He just was a rough ass character baby face. And I, I told him, I said, you know, you're kind of like cowboy was back in that era. Cowboy was not going to take a lot of bumps, right? But he was gonna let you run into his fist as often as you wanted to, uh, until it was time to go home and people loved it. They lived vicariously through that. So he started coming around in that regard, but, you know, and we all knew that somewhere down the road, uh, you know, at some point stone cold versus Bret Hart was money and it was money. WrestleMania 13 was a, was a hell of a match those dudes had. So it was a double turn and those are hard to pull off. I've been a part of many successful ones. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that, I, I think that, uh, we were on the cusp of doing a lot of things, but we needed Brett to make sure it all worked because he added stability and he added, uh, believability to the process that we we're trying to achieve. So it was a interesting time to say the least. And this episode of raw is really compelling from the standpoint that it opened the door for a lot of things. It's going to be a, it's a different day, different era, different priorities. And, uh, it was looking back on it is a whole lot more exciting now than it was then, because then we didn't know where we were going. Right. We, we didn't know, is this going to work? You know, and, and nobody created the attitude era nobody, nobody said, well, let's do this. Let's do the thing called, oh, attitude era. Shit. Nobody knew what that was. It was, you know, we wanted to get new talents involved. They were hungry. They were looking for an opportunity and nobody was hungrier than, than, uh, than stone cold. And I know this is not a stone cold show, but that was kind of the, the mindset of what we were trying to do. Give guys a chance that had been working a long time. They were good hands in the ring. They were pro wrestlers and knew what they were doing. And, and that included at the top of the very list was Bret Hart. Bret Hart was where it all started. And the trickle down was from, from Bret was, uh, uh, was prominent and significant to say the least. All right, boys and girls excited to talk to you about our sponsor Mando, their whole body deodorant is the real deal. And you've probably heard me talk about it before. I actually discovered it because my wife turned me on to it. She actually knew about and found the cream tube. And I didn't even know what that was. I've always just used stick deodorant and she's like, no, baby, this is for your whole body. And when they say whole body, they mean it. How about 72 hour odor control for your armpits, your package. That's right down yonder and beyond even your feet. It's long lasting. It's developed by a doctor. You're going to smell really good. It comes in a bunch of great scents. It's not going to get on your clothes. It's invisible. So it's not going to look weird. It's not going to cause you any irritation. And when I say it smells great, I mean it. They've got a bunch of different great scents like bourbon leather and clover woods, Mount Fuji and pro sport. They've even got unscented. If you're trying to be stealthy, my wife put me on the cream tube and I enjoyed it. 
But then I found out, hey, they got stick deodorant too. They sure do. And it too, 72 hour hour, 72 hour odor control. How do you beat that? And if you're wondering, yes, it's aluminum free. There's no aluminum in this. And they've even got body wash now with Mando and all your favorite scents. And it removes odor better than just soap. And it leaves you fresher than soap. It's powered by a mandelic acid. And so is their cleansing bar. But maybe the game changer is the deodorant wipes. Yeah, they got wipes. This makes it easy to travel and on the go to sort of freshen up. So it's like taking a shower without actually taking a shower. And if you've got any travel coming up, man, I can't recommend it enough. When you're trying to figure out what scent you like, I like bourbon leather. I think my wife likes Mount Fuji on me best. Uh, But I've heard some of my buddies, they really like pro sport. You can't go wrong. They got something for everybody. And I had a big travel week last week when I went to see Kevin Sullivan. I knew I was going to be hot and sweaty moving around in Tampa. It's always humid down there. I made sure I rocked some Mando. I was still smelling good when I got back to my hotel room. You will be too. I'm telling you, it really, really works. Created by a doctor who saw firsthand how normal BO was just being misdiagnosed and mistreated. Mando's the real deal. Aluminum free, baking soda free, cruelty free, dye free, and it's vegan. It's clinically proven to control odor better than just a, a shower with soap alone. I've tried it. I believe in it. You will too. And Mando starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with solid stick deodorant, the cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice. I recommend the mini body wash and the deodorant wipes. They'll even get you free shipping. Luckily, I got a discount code to help get you hooked up on my favorite smelling whole body deodorant on the market. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code. That equates to over 40% of your starter pack. Use JR at shopmando.com. That's S-H-O-P-M-A-N-D-O.com. And be sure to use our promo code JR. Shopmando.com. Promo code JR. Well, to be clear, it kind of is a stone cold episode because he's one of the opponents that Brett's looking forward to working with the most. And of course we know it'll be Brett's first opponent, but before we press play, I want to ask a couple more questions. One specifically about Brett Hart. Uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, when the timeline happened, but I know in 1996 is when we see uh, JJ Dillon leave and go to WCW. And I believe that happened the month prior in September. So I am curious since you're now going to be uh, trying to tackle some of the talent relations stuff. I know Bruce had a cup of coffee in that seat, I believe. Right. He did. But were you involved in any of the Bret Hart negotiation? No. And you know, that was a common denominator, uh, through the years with Vince, he took ownership of certain talents. Got it. Uh, when we brought in, uh, returned Hogan, you know, uh, I had no relationship with Hogan and I, unfortunately I still don't have one to this very day. I respect him and I don't dislike him. I just never got close to him, but Vince had Vince had been close to him and they had been, you know, ni- closer 19 is to 20 as my granny would say, but, uh, uh, no, I didn't have, that was all Vince. Some of those talents like warrior and, uh, uh, Brett, of course, the, the one that he let go of, because I got more results than, than Vince did was Austin, right? Austin became my guy. And, you know, I just, I did everything I could for Steve to win and for the company to win the co- for the company to win with Austin, make sure his contract is solid and he's happy and make sure he's getting paid well based on what he's earning and what he's selling. Again, the house show business was a huge component of what we were doing and, and added to the bottom line of these uh, guys, uh, income, but Vince was, uh, that Brett was Vince's guy and Vince wanted to handle Brett himself. And I think that was a smart move, quite frankly, uh, I could back it up and I could, you know, reinforce Vince's theories and his, his feelings and so forth to Brett on, when it was called upon, but, but Vince wanted to make sure he took care of Brett. And I said, have at it. Cause that gave us, you know, that helped me out a lot. That helped me get a deal done. Uh, basically cause Vince was trying to, Vince was, was ramrodding it. And I think that made Brett feel good that he was being attended to by the top guy and not a. Ham and Air from Oklahoma. Talk to me about Mr. Perfect. Uh, he's going to be a big part of the show. He's been promoted pretty heavily. This is essentially the return of Mr. Perfect to uh, Monday night raw. And of course the return of Brent Hart as well. Uh, but we know that 
well, perfect's not long for this world. He's eventually going to walk out and uh, go do the WCW thing and find himself becoming an in-ring competitor again. But at this point, he's been a pretty critical part of what you guys have been doing storyline wise with Mark Miro and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. And of course the intercontinental championship. And it felt like Mr. Perfect was going to be a good guy as weird as that may sound and help out Mark Miro. And of course, on this episode, we find out maybe not so much, but <laughs> it doesn't work out for Mr. Perfect here. Were you involved on a talent relations side in, in Mr. Perfect leaving? Yeah. Well, you know, it had to be because it, see, that was a di different mindset, a different, uh, a different synergy. Uh, you see Vince a lot coming in. You might not see as much of him going out. Right. And, uh, uh, but Kurt and I developed a good friendship over the whole deal. We even were broadcast partners, which I thought he was going to be. He reminds me, uh, in his broadcast work, Connie of, uh, CM punk in the recent days, he's a natural punk is a natural at doing commentary. There's no doubt in my mind. And uh, one of my, one of my goals somewhere down the road would be to do a show with, uh, a regular basis with uh, CM punk. I think we could be terrific together because I know how he thinks and how he works. Now you feed him things and you, you're, you're on the point guard. I got to get him the ball. And I, that's what I would like to try to do at some point in time. And I'm not knocking working with Tony or, uh, no, of course, Excalibur, even though that's what it's going to be made to be. Oh, uh, Ross didn't want to work with Giovanni and next <laughs> I, I never said that you dump bucks, please. Don't be that stupid. They assume too many things. Uh, but I knew that I, Kurt was having health problems. His, you know, and when a wrestler's back goes bad, it is a terrible thing. Yeah. Cause think of how many things that you do in a match that end with a flat back bump, a lot body slams, clothes lines, drop kicks. You got to fall somewhere. You got to fall some way. And nine times out of 10, it seems like it's on the, on, on your back. So he was having issues with his back and icing it up after every, every time he wrestled, he just was not in, uh, physically where he wanted to be. He wanted to be good. Cause look, when Kurt Henning was healthy, he was one hell of a hand. There's just no doubt about it. He was one hell of a hand. He looked great. His facials were priceless. He could cut a promo. He could work baby face. He could work heel. I know he wanted to work heel more than baby face. It was just fun for him. Much like the motivation for stone cold to be a heel in the beginning because he perceived to be more fun. Uh, but Kurt was just, uh, coming at the end of his run, his, his internal clock Conrad was ticking and he knew it was. So what are you, what are you going to do? You're going to chase the money. Yeah. I'm going to run after this last significant payday, get a few years guaranteed and then, uh, go from there. So, uh. And it's like if Kurt was around today, you know, we, you mentioned that I was at the New York city comic con, uh, last week. And, uh, can you imagine how many of those Kurt could have made? Oh, uh, huge. He'd been booked every, every week. There's every time they turn the lights on, you'd see Mr. Perfect hanging around. Yeah. But he'd do well. So, uh, yeah, I was involved just to get, you know, on the, on the exit, but it wasn't uh, a negative in, uh, interaction. It was simply, uh, you know, he, he wanted to go, he wanted out. It's how I looked at it. And he, he got a good money offered him. I don't know what it was. I didn't ask him. So, uh, but he, he knew that he was on his last legs cause his back and, uh, and off we went, we met a, we see him talking. I made a little parody of that in, in indirectly the other day when we talked about the Lloyd's of London thing on television. Yeah. People love you know? that. <laughs> so it's kind of fun, but it, it, it's, times are changing, man changing of the guard. We got to get some new blood. I also want to mention that, uh, even though this is a pretty monumental raw, okay. well, it doesn't go exactly the way everyone hoped. Uh, it was written in the observer here, even with the combination of the much ballyhooed return of Mr. Perfect, who, as it turned out, didn't return after all. And the announcement by Bret Hart and coming live one day after a pay-per-view show. The WWF still lost the Monday night battle to a generally lackluster WCW show on October 21st. Raw did a 2.6 rating and a 3.6 share, which in some ways has to be considered a positive against competition 
which included both the second game of the world series and NFL football while nitro did a 3.2 rating and a 4.6 share, which made it the closest race in several weeks. So you're in the middle of this losing streak here for these, uh, ratings wars. Um, and don't tell Eric, I told you this, but your show's probably the better of the two at this point. <laughs> I mean, adding Bret Hart to the mix is, is going to be something that's going to be a big deal for anybody, but still, I, I think sometimes fans get caught up in, um, the ratings head to head without understanding there is other competition. As we mentioned here, you've got both NFL football and the world series. October is a tough time. Right. In the, in the wrestling business, when you've got playoff baseball and Monday night football and another show, whew, that's a lot of competition, a lot of competition for the eyes of, uh, of the, of the TV viewer, no doubt about it. Uh, well, you know, they, they were providing an alternative. They were providing a different view and they had, a and they had acquired a lot of stars with name identity that were perceived as big timers. Uh, because of WWE, WWE television, uh, because those are the guys that, that Eric put the company seemingly to me. Now I might be wrong, seemingly on his, on the, on the back or his back were guys like Hall and Nash. And, and of course, then Hogan comes in and it, then does it really matter? Does it really matter who's left or who you're featuring Hogan Hall and Nash are going to elevate anyone that they touch in that era. And, uh, I thought they were used very wisely. Uh, I, I thought they, they killed their own deal when they started adding everybody and their sister to the NWO. I thought that was a mistake, but uh, that's just me talking. I, I don't know. It might not have been a mistake in Eric's mind, but, uh, nonetheless, uh, they had some magic dust kind of spread on this thing, man. They were, they had this, they had stars that people wanted, wanted to follow and talk about and see what was next, because you can't tell me that you're going to watch Hogan and Hall and Nash because of their, the great five-star matches, whatever that means, uh, on TV. Cause the number one, they're not going to wrestle at house shows. I don't know how many house shows those, those that trio made, but I would suggest it be minimal. Uh, and so I, I think that, you know, they, they, they had, the, they captivated the attention of the audience. And a lot of that was because they were allowed to say and do and have, keep their, maintain their heat, uh, especially when Hogan turned heel, it was a big deal. But, uh, then again, that's where I think there's where, uh, the wrestling business kind of had a big turn because they were heels, they were villains, but they were cool heels. And that's not a good formula. Sorry. I don't piss anybody off when JR is knocking the uh, Eric and or the WCW or not. I just philosophically believe that if you're going to be a true villain and you're going to motivate people to leave their homes, and jump in their car where they're snotting those kids and find a parking place at the venue and then pay, pay significant monies for uh, uh, tickets and a hamburger or a hot dog and a Coke or something that you need to be, you got to be a villain. I got to want to see you get your ass whipped. And I'm not so sure that's what was always the case, especially with the NWO, because they were too cool to, 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 you know, to, uh, to boo and, and to hate, there was no hate there. They were, they were attractions and they were significant attractions, but they were not true heels. You know, we were talking about, uh, Hall and Nash there. Uh, I wanted to circle back to something you said earlier about Bret Hart's contract. You said he deserved to be the highest paid performer on the roster. I and think so. When we talk about Hall and Nash in this era, oftentimes a phrase comes up that you and I've never discussed. And I want to get your take on it. What do you think of the, the famed favored nations clause, where if you have a contract, that's a pretty significant value. And then someone comes along and joins the team, but they're making more money. Well, you get bumped up to whatever they're making at the time. What do you make of that? I'm not a big fan of it. Conrad, if I was a talent that had a favored nations clause in my contract, I probably would be a much larger fan than I currently am. But all in all, uh, it was a smart move, I guess, by Barry Bloom, who's also my agent. Now, uh, I don't have a favorite nations. I don't know that, you know, 
uh, I'm not bitching about it. I just, it was a pretty, pretty good, uh, rabbit to pull off his hat, uh, on that deal. And because the value of Hall and Nash and those fellas, the favored nations thing uh, seemed to be, let's not lose these guys over this. Uh, cause we can comp- we can do this if we need to, all you gotta do is make sure you keep the favorite nation numbers, uh, within reason for your payroll and your budget, but I'm not a big fan of it. Quite frankly, I'm, 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 I'm a fan of you earning your raises and your bonuses on your merits and not on the ability for someone to negotiate a better deal with another talent. That's just me. Uh, but if you, if you got one, then it's a pretty cool deal. Cause you got a chance to make more money just because somebody else has got a good agent who's negotiating better deals. So I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, one last thing before we do our countdown, by the way, we're watching, uh, I guess I should list the season number. I hate that they do it this way, but it's season four episode 41 of Monday night raw, October 21st, 1996. We're going to give you a countdown momentarily. So fire up peacock. Make sure you've got yours muted and JR and I will give you some alternate commentary on season four, episode 41 of Monday night raw. It's October 21st, 1996, uh, buried alive, you know, it was what it was, but we also see a couple interesting things I want to mention here, uh, because that's the pay-per-view that happens right before this Monday night raw Terry Gordy debuts as the executioner. And I know that you were a big fan of all things, doc and Gordy once upon a time on the WCW side of things. And I know you love their stuff over in Japan, right? But it's been often said that Terry Gordy here, perhaps got a shot as a favor to doc Hendricks, AKA his old pal, Michael PS Hayes. And frankly, he just wasn't the same Terry Gordy. Do you have the same opinion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael was a catalyst in trying to get Terry work, but after Terry had that uh, drug overdose. Uh, I think it was on a plane ride or after plane ride from hell type thing. Uh, he, he never was the same. He was a, he's a step off and he had great timing when he was healthy and, uh, uh, one of the most athletic heavyweights I've ever seen. He was 300 pounds. You know, he was a, he was a star at 16 or 17 years old. He was a freak of nature. He just had that it thing. He had it charisma. He had it timing. It believability and everybody, including the Cowboys thought, and Ernie Ladd was another one that thought that, you know, Gordy is a star of the free birds and Michael talking and Gordy working. Then you throw a little buddy Roberts in there, buddy Jack, uh, and you know, it's, it's money, but Michael wanted to give him a chance. And I, uh, and, and I think Bruce probably was on the same page. We all had a, uh, an affinity for Terry, uh, knew his. It made some mistakes, but if we can find that spark again, what we were looking for is the same thing I was looking for with Mick Foley, an opponent for the undertaker. So Terry Gordy was brought in, uh, led by Michael Hayes's campaigning and others of us that agreed with that and went to Vince, Vince didn't, uh, have any pushback on it because I, you know, it, it was an experiment. What does he have left? Well, we found out he didn't have much left. God bless him. He just didn't. And uh, we wanted him to have a lot left. He had made himself a lot of money working with the undertaker. And if Terry Gordy had been the old Terry Gordy, his matches with the undertaker would have been legendary by now. They were the match that people were talking about. Much like we're talking about somewhere down the road to WrestleMania 13 with Britain, Austin, people still talk about that match for the artistry of it. And Terry Gordy could do the same thing when he was right, but mentally it just, it just wasn't there anymore. He just, that, that one last OD was took his toll seriously on him, so, but we were all, we we're all for it in the beginning, Conrad. And I'm not going to lie about that. It's just one of those experiments that you, you hope will work. Uh, but it unfortunately did not. What can you share with us about, um, the whole heel persona that they're at least trying with you here at buried alive, your microphone doesn't work. So you throw your headset at Vince McMahon and storm off. It's an interesting moment because, you know, we've been trying you as sort of the, the voice of razor and diesel. And you've told us before the fun story of you and Briscoe riding together and you're trying to get that promo down. 
I'm sure part of you likes the idea that, Hey, they're trying something new and I'm being challenged a little bit, but what do you think about sort of blurring the lines of reality, even as the broadcaster where you throw the microphone and storm off? Is that interesting to you? Or is this not really your deal? It never was really my deal, but, uh, I, I just went back to my roots and where you are, it's incumbent upon you to do what you're asked to do, told to do signed to do whatever I was always been a team player and I'm always going to be a team player. Uh, cause that's how I was brought into the business. Uh, so I, I didn't feel comfortable doing it because I didn't. And one of the reasons that Conrad was not just my, my massive ego was the fact I didn't think I was very good at it. Right. Uh, I didn't think that was the best use of my skill set. but, uh, you know, uh, and I, I guess even back all the way back then, Vince had the idea that I was not going to be a long-term broadcaster because of my Southern drawl and my look and so forth. And then along comes a couple of bouts of Bell's palsy and, you know, it makes it even more challenging for him because he's a looks guy and I, and I'm not a looks person as you can tell by looking at your screen right now. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't real comfortable with it. I, I didn't refuse to do it. I didn't negotiate not to do it. I just, what do you want me to do? Give me some point. Give me some, uh, direction. And so that's kind of where we were on that deal. But it was one of those ideas where you we're just, we, we, we recognized WCW too much through that vehicle. Yep. And I didn't think that was smart. And, uh, but I, I was willing to see where it was going to go. And, you know, I, and we did that. So, but I was never real comfortable with it because again, I didn't think I was very good at it. Not because I didn't want to do it. My ego is too big. I just think I, I didn't, what, what do I have to add to this equation? I'm not going to go out in the ring and take bumps. I'm going to be a manager. So, you know, the hardest thing for me to do is to knock monsoon. Right. And I, I did a promo where I knocked gorilla and I love gorilla like a father. And I, and I, of course, addressed that with him and he just shook his head. He, he shook his head about the whole damn creative. And he said, don't worry about me, kid. We're all right. Just do what you got to do. And I did, I did what I had to do. All right. How about a little cheat code? How about a little life hack? That's what my wife calls Lumen. Lumen is the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs, and it even gives you tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, your workouts, your sleep, and even your stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism, whether you're burning mostly fats or carbs. And then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals. So you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. And here's why your metabolic health matters. Think of your metabolism as your body's engine. It's how your body turns the food, the food you eat into fuel that keeps you going. And because your metabolism is really at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a whole host of benefits like easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, better sleep. Lumen gives you recommendations to improve your metabolic health with each breath. And my wife explained this to me. It's almost like an overwhelming advancement in technology. I can't really describe how excited she was to see this because she didn't even know technology like this existed. My wife in real life is uh, in the medical research field. So whenever you see like a, a new drug get approved and they do the with all the side effects at the end, well, that's what she does. So she is always fascinated by the advances in technology and medicine But this also comes at a time where she's working on her fitness journey. You've probably seen me post some of my pictures on the accounts of her in bikini competitions and fitness competitions. I mean, she's really taking her fitness to a whole new level. And as a result, she's learning more about her body than ever before. And there's a lot of stuff out there that we read about that feels sort of one size fits all. And here's an example she told me about that she's found through Lumen. There's a a, a lot of talk about 18 hour fasting right now. But what if your body does its best work at like a 12 hour fast and after the 12 hour mark, the fasting actually starts to work against you. Your body is like, Hey, what's going on? We're not eating anything. We need to do something differently. Well, you wouldn't know that if you didn't have a lumen, 
But the technology for this was usually reserved for doctor's offices. That's the, the picture that my wife painted for me. Think about a guy on a treadmill hooked up to a bunch of wires. He's got a mask on and you see the doctor with the clipboard there. That's the way this used to be done. And now you've got a handheld device. You can keep by your bedside on your desk, just throw it in your backpack with you. It's with you as you go. You breathe into this dude, this lumen, and on your app, it tells you exactly what's going on. You don't have to schedule an appointment for next February and get on a treadmill and get hooked up to all these machines. No, it's just with you. Lumen is a real life hack to know exactly what's going on in your body and how to get the most out of it. They, I mean, they're going to give you a daily plan based on your breath for what you should eat that day to have your body working at its peak. This feels like some George Jetson stuff, y'all. So if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash grilling JR for 15% off your lumen. That's L U M E N dot me slash grilling JR for 15% off your purchase. And thank you Lumen for sponsoring today's episode. So let's jump into it. Let's fire up the Peacock network here. Season four, episode 41. I'm at all zeros here. It's uh, October 21st, 1996. I'm going to give you a quick countdown. And then when I say play, we'll press play. Uh, I'll start with three and go three, two, one play, and then we'll go. So Jim, are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, here we go in three, two, one play. The world wrestling federation for over 50 years, the revolutionary force in sports entertainment. The images of Bret Hart's departure at WrestleMania 12 are still burned in our memories. For six months, the hitman has carried the pain of leaving behind his title, his fans, and his legacy. Ever since then, rumors have persisted about his future, and tonight, we all very anxiously await what he has to say. Perfection is the goal of every superstar, but only one man has lived it. Tonight, the celebrated return of one of the most revered athletes in the history of the World Wrestling Federation. The most perfect intercontinental champion of all time returns to teach a lesson in humility to a new generation snob. Two great champions return tonight on Monday Night Raw. Raw. Down the drain, old buddy. (laughs) I love the old intros here. This is fun, man. It's a it's a nice setup for the for the episode. I think more shows should do that. I totally agree. Sort of reset, give you a heads up where we are, what's going on, the context, if you will. And, uh, yeah, Vince McMahon, let's take a listen. So we know now we've got survivor series as our next pay-per-view it's in our sights. Sid has just won a number one contender matchup, uh, at the pay-per-view. So he is now in line to get a title shot. And of course, famously, as everyone knows the story, the plan was going to be Vader and Sean doing that trilogy, SummerSlam, survivor series and Royal rumble. Sid gets the spot. And honestly, Sid did pretty damn well in that role. Didn't he? Yeah, he did. You know, when Sid started, uh, fist bumping fans on the way to the ring, uh, you saw the connection at that point for some reason. And I don't say that incredulously, but for, for whatever reasons they may have the fans, they, they, uh, they, they migrated to Sid. He's believable. Yeah. And he looks great. He's what they wish they looked like. Yeah. He, you know, if you live vicariously through a lot of the wrestlers, which a lot of, a lot of fans have done, including myself as a kid. Uh, you know, and here he gets, old, he steps over the top rope, a la Andre, but much easier than Andre used to do it quite frankly. But, uh, Sid was an attraction. Sid, Sid vicious was not an everyday wrestler. He was not an everyday wrestler. He was an attraction. There's our old friend, Owen. So glad AEW is doing some stuff with Owen's family, his, his widow, Martha. And I see he just got a new haircut there. If I got some fan here, the barber slices cut it for free. Clarence Mason is in tow here. Of course, uh, 
Clarence Mason is replacing Jim Cornette as Owen Hart's manager here. As you see yeah. him sporting one of the tag titles and good luck, good luck with that. Good luck with that Conrad. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Clarence Mason named after, uh, Clarence Darrow and Perry Mason, two well-known barristers. And, um, the whole Owen Hart issue has become a hot issue online with fans, but I, I for one, am just glad that Owen's family now has, uh, some connection to wrestling. It just feels like for so long yeah. it was disjointed. And now the idea that whether it's with WWE or AEW wrestling fans just want to celebrate the memory of Owen Hart. And I'm glad that now there's an opportunity to do that. Me too. Me too. And it's all intended in the, in the best of ways. It'll be done uh, class, in a classy way, like that man Owen Hart is. Well, look at the size difference. What do you think well, the, of the old red, white, and blue setup here? I mean, this is sort of classic WWF. The blue turnbuckles, the red, white, and blue ropes, uh, the blue ring skirts, the light canvas. Um, this was really sort of the hallmark of the WWF for a long time. And we know that's all going to change not too long after this with the attitude era, and it's going to go more red and black. Did you think this was just more of the eighties look? Yeah. Yeah. More of the eighties, uh, Rob, Rob got his own look. Yeah. And, uh, that was, I think that was smart marketing. Quite frankly, the red and black became the team colors. I used to have those red and black Nikes, those Jordan where the hell they were. I don't even know how you come across them. They, but when we went black and red, those shoes, I saw those shoes in the store. So then I need to wear these on TV. Cause I get a lot of shots of my feet on television. You know, <laughs> <laughs> whenever somebody breaks a cinder block over your head or shoves your yeah. head in another man's ass, all that type of stuff. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Gotta be fashionable when you're getting humiliated. Uh, Meltzer is not a fan of Sid. He would write Sid beat Owen by DQ. When Smith interfered, Michaels made the save and Sid and Michael shook hands. Sid has gotten so bad. It's almost amazing. He's always been bad, but compared to what he is now, he used to be like flair in his prime. Uh, well, I don't know about all that, but it is interesting that, you know, it certainly feels like Meltzer has his favorites, but that doesn't always relate to what the crowd in the seats is saying. I mean. He got a huge ovation here and, uh, a big reaction from fans. And we see Davey boy running down now, but still maybe Meltzer not so sold on his in-ring ability. Do you think in your opinion that Sid was sort of all sizzle, very little steak, not all sizzle. Uh, but I think that uh, he was an attraction attractions are, are to be seen seldomly and kept in their lane and, uh, so and we're, I'm in a commercial break. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I, I don't think that he was never going to be a, a funk or a Briscoe. Uh, he was an attraction. He's like, I tried to explain to the writers, uh, that, you know, he's like Vader. He's like Vince's dad booked Andre. The less you see them, the better off you are. And here we are back in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I haven't been to Fort Wayne since that time. I don't think, but look how Owen breaks down the big guy. He keeps Sid out of trouble. Didn't let Sid look bad, takes care of his opponent and a smart strategy to try to destroy the vertical base, get the six, nine guy off his feet, use the ring post, which is unforgiving and always wins as a, as a weapon. We just saw a promo for the old superstar hotline. And, uh, of course the Ross report was featured there and you were trying to sell why psycho Sid will be the next WWF champion. We've talked a little bit before about the WCW hotline. What can you tell us about the WWF hotline? Did you have any quote unquote supervision or was that just your baby to run or what went into the WWF hotline? Well, it was my baby to run my, my day. Uh, you know, it was my, it was my baby to to do my, my, my particular report. I didn't have any creative uh, issues or control influence. And Davey boy's getting his cheap shot in while baby Earl Hebner is back his turn and look at Owen Drick traffic there. He went right around nice subtlety fans to look at. He went, he went, when it was time to go past the referee, Owen went past the referee because 
the damage had allegedly already been done. So I didn't have any back to the hotline. I, I did my day. You know, I thought uh, that would be a great source of income coming going forward, but I never, I never met a dime off the hotline. No extra money. Now I know when Mean Gene went to WCW, he got a piece of the action. Yes, he did, and, and did real well with it, which I was happy to hear. I didn't have that luck. So it's funny. To see, it's funny to see a smaller man uh, use a headbutt. I was going to say the same thing. Um. Do you have a, uh, I'm not saying this to be funny. Cause I often do this as a funny ha ha, but do you have a favorite Sid match? Do you remember there being a time in this era of Sid where he's going to be the WWF champion and heck even main event, the next WrestleMania for you guys. Do you remember there being one match where you're like, man, that's probably as good as we're going to have a match. It seemed, it seemed to be when he won the title with Sean at survivor series. I agree. Yeah. I think that to me was, uh, uh, the crescendo for Sid of matches that I can recall off the top of my head. And let's also be, uh, honest. He was in there with one of the best ever. Yep. And it was a long-term storyline that was going to cultivate in the Alamo dome in Sean's hometown. So all the pieces were already set in place. And, uh, I think that was part of his best, his best night was that night. Of course it was at the garden. So that always add a little, the garden crowd and the, the arena. Always added some value. Talk to me about Sid's reputation amongst the boys. You know, we know, uh, fans love him. And we also know that fans have heard a lot about his unreliability. We'll talk about that in a minute, but as far as the other opponents, a guy like Owen, a guy like Sean, did they like Sid as an opponent? Obviously it's a different style match for them, but that whole David versus Goliath thing, they probably enjoyed, huh? Yeah. He Sid was uh, predictable. He had a, he had a, didn't have a, uh, a nice choke slam. He did not have a wide ranging, uh, array of, of, uh, of wrestling maneuvers that he perfected. He was, I, he was one dimensional, but in, in a, in a good way. Uh, and you notice a fan standing on their feet now, cause Sid is getting toward the end and there's the bulldog in, interfering, which will cause the disqualification. Uh, but they, he, he, you knew what you're getting with Sid. And he was, he was just a, he, 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 it worked out pretty well. There's Sean Michaels street shoes on slipping, and sliding around. Let's track a little bit. Let's listen. Look at this. Sean Michaels all over the British bulldog. And the bulldog goes for the ride. So I can't keep his watch on. I saw that he was careful. He's got to wear, was... wear that Ric Flair Rolex, you know, be as much of the nature boy as he can be. Yeah. When he was throwing those punches, you could tell he was like spreading <laughs> his fist out. Like, Ooh, I don't want this thing to fly off in the crowd. So there you have it. The storyline starts as psycho Sid being a good guy, you know, he's just hands. wrestling a heel and he's shaking hands with the top baby face and the champ and. We know that's not going to last long. Let's, uh, let's track a little bit as they're conversating doing right now. Look at this. See, I knew Sid wasn't playing with a full deck, but John Michaels must be a couple of beers short of a six pack dude. Even come out here and help the man who's going to try to take his title from me. I think they're trying to talk things out here, but I'm not so sure that there is not a difference of opinion. All right. Uh, it's all uh, about the WWE. That, that, that means Vince is ready. And he said, all right, it's ready to go to the next piece of business. <laughs> I like that. You speak Vince, you know, when he's uh, a little annoyed and ready to move on. Absolutely. Nobody speaks Vince better than old Brucey though. So we see, uh, some, some still photos from, uh, the buried alive show. And I like when you guys wouldn't show video clips because you're still trying to sell the Tuesday replay for the pay-per-view. Yeah. So you give these credit for the photos to the WWF magazine, but in reality, they're just screen grabs. Hey, did you hear uh, the mention of on a W the night of Bruce? I did old MJF saying he had a uh, Brucey on speed dial. That shocked me. It's a good little line. I guess I didn't have any idea they were going to do it. Uh, that was MJF going to the business with he and Tony Khan. 
uh, and you kind of give MJF this leeway. As we're seeing these uh, stills of the buried alive match, and and I, I, knowing Tony Khan and MJF as I do, I think it's all a part of a storyline. I don't think it was just indiscriminate. I don't think it is threw it out there to, to get a, a pop. I think there's something to it in the in the back end. We'll just have to wait and see. And we see there the executioner broke the shovel over the head of the Undertaker, and as we know, even though it looked like Mankind had lost the match and the undertaker had won. The executioner comes out, breaks that shovel over the undertaker down goes taker. And, uh, they're going to start that filming. Terry that Gordy one. looked good too, Conrad. He looked, he did. It's just a tone and definition in his, his upper body. Uh, and that's a good angle. That's a good, uh, situation to shoot an angle to marry undertaker and uh, the executioner. But, uh, we just couldn't play it out. We just couldn't get it. Get, couldn't get there. And then you see the, uh, the lightning strike, the, the grave here. And of course we get that hand bursting through. And, uh, by the way, the WWE warehouse still has that tombstone that we're taking a look at there. As we see now the smoking guns coming to the ring, boy, has Billy Gunn found the uh, fountain of youth or what? I think he has, man. I, I ask him that every week. Oh, look who's there. Let's take a listen here. Oh, yeah, me too. Did you work on that overnight? No, I think you're not sitting on the mic cord today. Oh, there's nothing, there nothing there. Okay. You fire that audio man, you should fire him. Right. I'll In fire him for you. What is Bret Hart going to say? <laughs> you said you were going to deliver him. What's Bret Hart going to say? Well, you'll find out because I just got through talking to Bret Hart. He's here in Fort Wayne, and, well, you'll be most interested, I think, to hear what he's got to say. I think everyone is going to be most interested. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, tag team action. We've got the Smoking Guns, former tag team champions against the Godwin family, former tag team champions as well. So now we've got the, uh, the Cowboys and the Hog Farmers. Yeah. This is Vince McMahon. This is in his wheelhouse, boy. He loves it. He loves it. Stereotype is stereotype could be, you know, the God has got to carry a pig each one yeah. each and hillbilly gym I remember and a slot the, bucket, the pig thing. And we, and Owen got turned all the pigs loose in Vince's office where he got to work. You hear that story? Oh yeah. That's a good one. I want to mention too, uh, this is a pretty monumental role for a lot of reasons, not just because of the Bret Hart thing, which we're going to listen to shortly. And, uh, of course we're going to get into the Mr. Perfect stuff as well, but this is the first time that raw is live on TSN. And of course that's the station in Canada that carries the show. And for a long time, especially when you look at the next year of the WWF boy, Canada is such a big part of what you guys are doing. And it feels like, Hey, if houses are down here in America domestically, well, let's just go across the border because Canada at that point is almost like a wrestling crazed country. And, and you've now got this show live on TSN. That's a big deal for the company. Is it not? Yeah, it is. You you notice there a hillbilly Jim stepping on the top rope. If Sid's going to be your next champion and Sid's the number one contender. I would not have had hillbilly step over the top rope. Well, first of all, he really couldn't do it without balancing. I mean, it's a teeter totter deal. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. don't want to get your yam bag hung on those top ropes. I can promise you. I can't imagine not that feels that, good. Not that I've ever done that, but I have, I've had, I have had a yam bag issue on the second rope and it's not fun. Well, Jim, you brought it up. Uh, let's hear about that yam bag. <laughs> yeah. Well, everybody, every man's got one. Well, yours specifically grinding on the ropes. How did this happen? Tell us about your yam bag incident. Well, I got in the ring and I stepped in between the second and third rope and the, there was a heel there. And so all he did was reach down and, and, uh, pull a rope up like a band, a fiddle string. And it hit me about three times where I could get my fat ass off of it. It's not funny. It's not funny. Conrad, the misery of others should not be the pleasure of yours. <laughs> This is a, uh, I don't know how many times these guys work together. Too many I had to be in a hundreds. You know, Phineas is a, one of the top chefs in Florida right now. I heard that. You know that. I heard yeah, that. He's, re- he's really good. Legit. And, uh, 
Mark Gunn is an electrician also in Florida. Good guy. He don't like me much because of brawl for it all. As if I had a damn thing to do with it. I didn't create it, but boy, he's a, he's a stud now. And then Billy's uh, as a coach down at AEW and his two sons are trying to make their way up the ladder as we go to the real, real, real quick break here. Now we're right back. Uh, and we're still in Fort Wayne, Conrad, by the way, <laughs> that's very marketable to all the lovely folks in Fort Wayne, but old Phineas has done well for himself. He's a character. He's lucky. He made it through the attitude era. <laughs> what a likable, funny guy. Yeah. Naked Midian. What a gimmick oh, that was. Good God. You know, Billy Gunn was very underrated when Billy, uh, Billy, I, when I, when the smoky guns broke up Conrad and Billy went another direction, uh, with uh, road dog, believe it or not, I wasn't sure that was going to work. I think a lot of people felt like, cause you originally, uh, this gets glossed over, but when they break up, you try him as rockabilly yeah. and put him with honky tonk man, which is akin to the kiss of death. Uh, but somehow, some way. He has the best yet to come with the whole new age outlaws deal. Right. And then from there, you would try to break him off into a single star. Once again, he wins the king of the ring. Uh, the rock just murdered him forever and ever. Amen. As a singles competitor on live TV with a promo. And that was it, man. It's uh, it's kind of a shame because he was such a big part of tag team wrestling for the company here. Yeah. Multiple time champion with the smoking guns, arguably the new age outlaws. Um, one of the top acts in wrestling at the time. I mean, the whole crowd knew their whole rap word for word. I mean, yeah. th- there are different levels of quote unquote over. And I know the, the old term was a road warrior pop, but man, the new age outlaws, they were right up there. Weren't they? Yeah, they were, they were, they were a great act. They did, did really well. And it, it, it opened the door for road dog. So we got two big wins out of this situation and, and I got a, a main event level attraction from these two dudes who could both not anybody on the roster that, uh, that road dog and uh, Billy could not have a great match with. That's the slot drop Conrad. If you're wondering at home, it's like the scorpion death drop only a different name. <laughs> really? I, the, what, <laughs> hey, one of my. I don't want to say it's a pet peeve, but goddamn fans are so wrapped up over names. Of yeah. Holes. Yeah. What if I'd have been on TV and I said, when Sting did his last scorpion death drop, oh my God, it's the slot drop. The internet would have blown up. It's yes. Been, been, been uh, fuzzy. The, uh, the irony man of Vince McMahon, as we see, there's some problems here with, uh, the bar, uh, the Barton Billy situation. Oh, we're going to announce the hall of fame. Let's track it here. Pat Patterson entered the world wrestling federation in 1979 and became the first ever intercontinental champion in the eighties. Patterson was part of the WWF broadcast team. And then later went on to work in the front office. Superfly Jimmy Snuka entered the world wrestling federation in 1982. The phenom from the Fiji Islands took the WWF by storm with his high flying tactics. Or who's reading this thing? Move, the splash off the top rope, or even that's Kevin Kelly. Age were typical oh, okay. of his spectacular style. Vincent J. McMahon, already in the Madison Square Garden Hall of Fame, is known as the father of the WWF and is credited for originating the World Wrestling Federation. The Hall of Fame is just part of the Survivor Series weekend. And for ticket information, call Ticketmaster at two one two three zero seven. 7171. What are we yeah, getting, a, ladies and I like that. You know, this is really the first time that you guys are bringing back the Hall of Fame. Like, oh, I see Mr. Perfect doing squats. Oh, and Hunter Hearst Helmsley took him out. Let's listen. Look what he did. Oh, Helmsley, I can't believe this. So, of course, we know Hunter was supposed to be uh, involved in this Mr. Perfect thing. Mr. Perfect warming up in the back. And, of course, there's going to be a plan, damn it. But I like that you guys were bringing back the hall of fame. I did too. I, I think it's great. We just saw a, a billboard there in town where locally on the billboard, what's being promoted is, uh, the, or the two superstars are Bret Hart and Sonny. 
Now we've got a promo here. Boom Tour is exploding with non-stop action and excitement as it sets the blow the roof off an arena near you. Tomorrow night, we make our way to the Cincinnati Gardens. Wednesday, we visit Evansville Roberts Municipal Stadium. Thursday, See how important our shows were? Dude, huge. I mean, that's big time stuff right there. When you're using your valuable TV time. And this is really what wrestling was about. I mean, for years and years and years, you used your television almost as like an infomercial to get you to buy tickets. Correct. And of course we realized the industry's changed and entertainment's changed and it's less about these live events and more about the licensing fee. So here's a clip from Livewire. Like some jabroni and show half of a match. We went down to the basement, the famous Stu Hart basement, and I whipped his <laughs> for 30 minutes. Put the sharpshooter on him for 10 minutes. Then Stu came down. Ah, Steve, let go of Brett. So I beat Stu that. Yeah, All right, Stone Cold continuing to challenge Brett the Hitman Hart. What is that answer? And of course, uh, Farouk on Livewire. Ladies the and injured gentlemen, Farouk, I might say. On please Livewire. welcome. This coming Saturday morning. The best there is. Here we go. The best there was. No walk in my lines, Vince. God <laughs> damn it. Will be Brett, the Hitman Hart. Nice little pop. What Wayne, Indiana, by the way. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, obviously, you would wish, under different circumstances, that you had a big market for this. Uh, uh, not maybe not Fort Wayne, Indiana. I know. No disrespect to them, but you wish you were in a Chicago or a New York city or something like that. Yeah. Uh, especially just, didn't work, just didn't work out that way, Connie and getting Brett to commit to coming back. You're, you're not, you don't have a lot of, a lot of options and you get any, any strike while the iron's hot, as they say down there in Alabama, isn't it interesting too? He's out here and he's going to produce a sheet of paper in his backs in his back pocket. He's out here, sans leather jacket. And it feels like most of the time when we saw Bret Hart, we would see Bret Hart in that leather jacket. Yeah, it was different. I don't know the reason for that. I'm sure he had it with him. Maybe just one of those nights he decided to go to plan B as far as the attire is concerned. It makes me think maybe it's more, Hey, we're trying to show that, Hey, this is real. I think I did an action figure that coat on. All right. Here's the deal. As kids, man, we all woke up on Saturday morning and fired up some cartoons or some wrestling. I know I was watching wrestling, but I also did it with a big bowl of cereal. But as an adult, I realized I probably shouldn't be eating all that sugar. And most cereals don't give us the protein we need first thing in the morning. But then my wife found magic spoon. It's a nostalgically delicious cereal that tastes just like my childhood favorites, but without the sugar and with a ton of protein. And if you're already a magic spoon fan, boy, I've got some big news for you. Magic spoon turned their super popular cereal into high protein treats that are light, crispy, and taste just like those classic crunchy cereal bars. Magic spoons, brand new treats are so delicious. They've become my go-to midnight snack. My wife even uses it as a pre-workout. Every serving of magic spoon has 13 grams of protein, zero grams of sugar and four grams of net carbs. So you can feel good about what you're eating. The most popular flavors are fruity and cocoa, but there's so many more and the new treats they're brand new and they're crispy. They're crunchy. They're airy. And it's an easy way to get 12 grams of protein on the go. And for the first time ever, magic spoon treats are available in grocery stores with delicious flavors like marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. And yes, those marshmallow ones taste exactly like you hoped, just like mom used to make. Get $5 off your next order at magicspoon.com slash JR or look for Magic Spoon on Amazon or in your nearest grocery store. That's magicspoon.com slash JR to get $5 off Magic Spoon. Hold on to the dream. Let's, uh, let's take a listen and see. What he says in the interview, we're going to track the whole thing. Brett, I know you have a lot to say. We're all wondering if Bret Hart's going to retire. Bret Hart's going to come back and answer the challenge of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Are you going to take a front office position? Are you going to make movies? Please tell us what's in the future for Bret the Hitman Hart. And by the way, welcome back. Well, I missed everybody.
I just want to say that uh, for the past couple of weeks or maybe a little more, I've had to deal with a lot of, uh, a lot of things and uh, well for one there was a certain rival wrestling organization that uh, all I could say is they made me a great offer and they dealt with me with integrity in nothing but an honorable fashion and I can't say anything bad about anything that they uh, and how they represented themselves or me and uh, I was faced with this incredibly tough dilemma that if I decide to go back to wrestling whether I should in fact come back to the WWF or find new adventures somewhere else I was, it was about that long ago that I said, these are my words, I think, that, I, that I'm not greedy for money. I'm greedy for respect. And until you actually have to step into my shoes and make that kind of a decision, when you get offered a, a, a great offer and you have to decide which one you're going to take. And I've done a lot of soul searching you know, nobody has any idea how much soul searching I've done over this. But when it comes right down to it, that everything I've ever done and everything I ever plan on ever doing, I owe it all to my WWF fans. And I won't be going anywhere. The WWF. Well, I'll be with the WWF forever. Whoa. All right. All right. <laughs> Shit. Now I want to address. <laughs> that got you, didn't it? Yeah, that's funny. People wonder if I left because maybe I'm, maybe I'm a sore loser. Maybe I am. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Shawn Michaels, the World Wrestling Federation champion. I want to make something very clear, because it might not have seemed like it at the time. But Shawn Michaels beat me fair and square right in the middle of the ring, and there's no excuses for it. I might not be real thrilled about it, but I knew when I climbed back through the ropes after that 60-minute match, I knew what was at stake and I lost and I have no excuse for it. You know, I, I consider Shawn Michaels my opponent, not my enemy. But Shawn Michaels, there's just something about you that really bugs me. Something about you that bugs me. Shawn Michaels, you might be a little younger than I am. You might be a little more, you might even be a little more popular, popular. Oh, there's people out there that might think that Shawn Michaels is even a little bit cuter than I am. <laughs> Shawn Michaels is a great wrestler and he's done a great job as champion. Look at my head of hair, Conrad, isn't that wonderful? But there's two things that Shawn Michaels will never, ever be. <laughs> He will never ever be as tough as me. With all due respect. And he will never ever be as smart as me. I'm not so certain I would concur with. I think Richard Nixon said it best. Then again, it may be true. You learn from defeat, and you come back and you beat him the next time. Which is why. I've decided to accept the challenge of the best wrestler in the WWF today and in the Survivor Series I will face 
Stone Cold Steve Austin. As T.L. Hopper looks on, Tony Anthony. I might be a little rusty, and maybe I won't be. But Steve Austin, I want you to know one thing. Madison Square Garden. It's not a church, but it's holy ground. And Steve Austin, Stone Cold, we'll see who kicks whose ass in Madison Square Garden. Crowd seems happy, Connie. It's a sickening, McMahon. It's overwhelming, it's what it is. Since I've been off, I've uh, had a chance to really think about a lot of things. And I owe everything I got to my fans all around the world. I got the most incredible fans all over the world, from Germany to the United States, Canada. It's an incredible honor and a privilege to have fans like that. And it's something I take quite seriously about being a role model. And I think that uh, the one thing that's been missing in the World Wrestling Federation for about the last five or six months has been me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, that's the six months I've ever seen. I just want to say, you know, people ask me what. Why am I coming back? Why do I want to come back? Yeah, why? Money. It's not that much fun sometimes, especially if you can afford not to, to come back and get kicked around and beat up. It's a tough job and it's a hard way of life. And I got to go home and spend a lot of time with my family. They got There's this one here. little boy in Canada that uh, basically worshipped me and I was his biggest hero and it's something I take an, an incredible amount of pride in and this little boy one day he got real sick and it didn't take very long it took just a matter of a few hours and this little boy became the sickest little boy in Canada and I went to his bedside and I promised this little boy on his last legs, when they didn't think he would make it through the night. I promised this little boy that if he would just pull out of that, if he'd just come through, if he could just kick out, that I would come out of retirement for him. And as soon as I said that in his ear, he, he started to come out of it. Well, I wish I, have a, I wish I could tell you I have a happy ending here, but I don't. Just when we thought this little boy was going to turn the corner, he didn't. And that little boy passed away. And that little boy was my nephew. But the, the reason that I've decided to come back, and people can think all they want to, and they can, they can guess that I've come back, that I planned this out a long time ago, but the fact of the matter is, from that very day, I promised myself that I would come back and I would give wrestling fans and little kids all around the world somebody that they can look up to, somebody that doesn't necessarily... Hey, I can't dance and I don't pose too well for uh, girly books. <laughs> But I am. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. And I'm back. Thank you very much. Yes! So what'd you think? Great baby face promo. And you don't hear too many long ones like that in the middle of the show. Right. But Vince wasn't sitting at Gorilla to make her to shut her down. I thought it was great.
at this yeah. point, he, he probably could have did whatever the hell he wanted. Right. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No doubt. So we're getting to our main event. Now we see Hunter coming to the ring. This is going to be a, a big segment, but you know, this return, if you will, for Bret Hart has been discussed a lot over the years. What'd you think of that segment? Would that segment stand up today in 2021? I think it would. I think it would. I think the more honest you can be with your audience and, uh, uh, the better off you are. So, uh, that's my take on that deal. Reality based. That was very reality based. Cause I could promise you that there no writer was harmed in the filming of that segment. In other words, it's Brett's words, his feelings and so forth. So, uh, I thought, I think it would have held up today. You'd have some heel fans, you know, that would be cat calling and things of that nature. We want to mention, um, Meltzer's right up here. He says Hart gave probably the best interview of his career and one of the best interviews you'll ever see, basically acknowledging the very item items he was going back and forth with in his own head over the past several months. Hart talked about the death of his nephew, Matthew Annis over the summer and how he had promised him he would return to wrestling. The story Hart spoke of was true. As he told Annis, if he'd get better, he promised to return to wrestling. Actually at the time he said at SummerSlam and that for a brief moment, Annis responded Hart both praised Shawn Michaels as a great wrestler. Didn't complain about the finish of the WrestleMania match, simply saying he had lost and didn't take losing well and said he was tougher than Michaels and smarter than Michaels and made remarks about not being able to dance, maybe not being as cute and not posing in girly magazines. Now, of course that girly magazine talk is going to ultimately become a talking point between their real life relationship, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, uh, as the legend goes, by the way, the original creative that Vince had in mind, quote, Hart had been asked over the weekend by WWF to, in a dramatic fashion, rip up the WCW contract on the live interview as a retaliation for things such as Medusa throwing the WWF women's belt in the garbage can, but refused to do so. So yeah. Vince maybe was, uh, what do they say? Gotten to, he wanted him to rip up the WCW offer, but it didn't happen. And it didn't matter. I mean, would that have made the thing, the interview better no. or worse? No, I don't think so. You, in a moment like that, you really need to rely on the instincts of your talent as our, our beloved gorilla monsoon steps into the ring as a whole. Oh, pass. And look, old JR's back in there. We got a big announcement here. Let's take a listen. Big man, let me take care of some business here. What's right. going on? What do you mean, what's going on? Everybody saw what you did, Helmsley. You think you pulled the big one off? You run the card into the back of my leg. Now I got Gorilla Monsoon out here talking to the doctors in the back, telling me I can't wrestle you tonight. You think you pulled it off? Well, it's based on what the doctor has told me. I'm not allowing Mr. Perfect to wrestle here tonight. Wait a minute. Because he's a chicken. You got no guts, Perfect? I'm not allowing him to wrestle here tonight, period. Then what of the presence? I'll tell you what I've done, Helmsley. Mark Merrow, the stand-up kind of guy that he is, and the information that I gave him that brought him the Intercontinental Championship, the stand-up guy offered to wrestle you in my place. Huh? Look, I don't have any contract to wrestle him. I'm under no obligation. I want, I want him. I'm under no obligation to wrestle him, Monsoon. That's right. That's exactly perfect. correct. You are not obligated. Your contract to wrestle this gentleman. He is not wrestling here tonight, so you can leave if you like. Well, wait a minute. You don't have the guts to wrestle Merrill? No, you wrestle him, right? He had no problem. Merrill will wrestle you. I'll tell you what. The only way I'll wrestle him is if he puts that on the line. Put the Intercontinental title on the line and let's do it. Yeah. He'll do that in a heartbeat. I mean, what kind of champion are you? Show him what kind of champion. Of course he'll wrestle you. Wait, that's up to Gorilla Monsoon. You know, it's Mr. Perfect, you helped me out to win the Intercontinental belt. Hey. I'm going to return the favor. Let's get it on! Not till, that's Gorilla Monsoon giving his permission. Excuse me, Mr. Perfect. 
you can you cannot sanction this match. Only I can sanction an intercontinental title match. Are you yeah. saying you can't wrestle? I'm saying if he agrees to put the title on the line, he said and he you would. agree to accept the match, I will officially make it. Right? If the belt's on the line, I agree. The match is made. Let's do it. Ah, yes, ladies and gentlemen, the intercontinental title. Right there, see it? Move right there, Conrad. Yep. Or I got through that second rope. If you pull those ropes down and let it go, right in the end bag. <laughs> Fantastic. We come back from break here and we see the action is already underway. Of course, this is the wild man, Mark Marrow. And uh, both of these guys had had a little cup of coffee over in WCW. I guess Johnny B. Bads was a little longer than John Paul Levesque. But uh, of course, Hunter came over in 95. And then a year later, what do you know? Here's Mark Marrow in 96. So a couple of guys are, are switching jerseys coming from the WCW side of things and, and moving north here. But we know that Hunter's career looked a little different than Mark Marrow's. And, uh, unfortunately Sable, his uh, manager on the outside, his real life wife, Raina Marrow, she ultimately would outshine him. And it's interesting how, you know, you look at the way things started here in this feud. And I think a lot of people probably would have predicted given the quote unquote heat brother of the curtain call that Mark Merrow might've had a bigger upside in the WWF, at least from a fan's perspective. What did the office think? Did the office think that Hunter was more money than Merrow? Uh, yeah, but they also thought that Sable was more money than any, any, either one of them. There you go. Uh, I remember Vince calling me to his office after he and I met with, uh, Mark and Rena. And he, he called me back in and I, I showed him to the door and, and got their, in their car and all that stuff. He calls me back in his office and says, did you see what I saw? You know, uh, so of course I said, I don't know if I did or not. He said, well, there, she's a star. I said, oh yeah, she is a star. It's hard to take your eyes off of her. And, and folks didn't take their eyes off of her. I mean, she, she's popped minute by minute numbers, just walking out the ring, wearing a t-shirt or something or selling something. She had the it factor that she can't manufacture, but I think Mark could have had a better run in WWF at the time without a doubt. And what a nice man. Good guy. He's a good guy. Now does a lot of motivational speaking. He's a good human being without question. And, uh, I just, uh, think the world of him as a human being. He was a Dusty Rhodes creation. And Dusty really fell in love with the Johnny B. Bad character. I remember that line, you know, I'm so pretty. I should have been born a little girl. I should have been born a little girl, Conrad. Conrad, can you imagine me and you have been born girls? God uh, damn, we'd have been ugly. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> Sorry. I'll speak for myself going forward. No, no, I'm for it. Uh, listen, I, I, we got mirrors here in Alabama. I know what I look like <laughs> with long hair. Yeah. I want to mention as we we're about to see a pretty big moment here. I mean, a title switch on raw these days, maybe not that big a deal, but back then it was, we just saw a big knee drop from Hunter here on Mark Merrow's head too. That was the entire time shot with the hard cam. And of course, from that angle, you could see that Hunter didn't exactly nail it. And of course, these days, the WWF probably overcompensates for that. Um, just a few weeks ago, there was a, a moment on SmackDown where Roman and, uh, Brock had some interaction, some physicality, if you will. And they counted, there were 11 jump cuts in 13 seconds or some such. Golly. And it feels as if this has been an edict, whether it's from Vince McMahon or Kevin Dunn, that in order to protect the business brother, uh, we want to make sure in this HD world that we're never showing that. Some of these punches aren't full throttle, if you will. Yeah. And as a result, a lot of fans are complaining that the show is just damn dizzying to watch now. <laughs> what do you think of this controversy that exists online with fans who hate the new, the new WWE style of cut, 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 cut from a production standpoint? Well, don't overthink it. You know, I, I don't know if it's the hill you want to die on or not, quite frankly. Uh, but I'm it, in the, in a broad stroke, you know, you shouldn't execute things that you don't do well. And, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, I didn't, I didn't see that, uh, that scenario you just described with Brock and, and Roman, 
uh, but nonetheless, uh, they, they both know what they need to do and, and, and they are going a little bit overboard. They meaning pronoun boy, goddamn pronoun boy. God damn you, Conrad. You're sitting there naked and rich and you're a billionaire. Uh, I don't know. I, I think it's much to do about not a lot. They're right. Do it right. And you shouldn't have to do these things, but, uh, I think they may take things like that a little overboard at times. And they may want to talk to their talent if they have the balls to talk to Roman or Brock about something that didn't succeed. I don't know how you expect those two dudes to be on the money. They don't, they have, a, how long has it been since Brock was in a match? Yeah. It's been a while. Hey, does blue chew work? If you're asking that question, we want you to know that blue chew is putting their money where their mouth is by giving you a month free blue chew is an online service that delivers you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis and Levitra, but at a fraction of the cost and in chewable form. The process is super simple too. You just sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door. And the best part, well, it's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Blue Chew wants men rock hard. That's what they told me. That's the mission. They will not stop until every man is bricked up like a brick house, until every tent is pitched, until every rod is raised. Discover your options at bluechew.com. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code JR at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is JR to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. Let's, yeah. uh, let's track it here as we listen to the end of this match with Mark Merrow and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. You can only find here in the World Wrestling Federation. Hunter Hearst Helmsley reversing. Nope. Here we go. No, no. Look out. Oh, no. Oh, oh I got to go see if Merrow. Come on, Merrow. Come on, don't interfere in this. I'm not going to interfere in anything. Hunter Hearst Helmsley sliding to the outside. Hey, wait a minute. I can't oh, see him. Helmsley, just... Helmsley just grabbed a chair. Wait a minute. Helmsley has a chair. The official foul. Sable. Sable's watching. She's what is Sable's she trying to grab the chair. Wait, wait a minute. Hunter Hearst. Oh, go ahead. No. Get up, referee. Ooh. Long fly ball down the left field line. It's Ferris out of here. What? Referee Tim White, owner of the friendly tap. What has happened? Finally clearing his head, fighting Irishman. Rena is beside herself, a.k.a. Sable. And you don't take your eyes off of her. Boy, Merrill knew how to sell that chair shot, didn't he? Yeah. He was a good soldier, man. Sometimes the squeaky wheel gets to the, the grease and he just like my chair in Oklahoma. And he didn't, he, he didn't, uh, he never made any complaints and that might've hurt him in the long run, to be honest with you, as silly as it sounds. So now we have a new. I said by heart. This whole thing has been a hoax. This whole thing. You might call it a perfect hoax. I can't believe what you have seen here tonight on Raw. I can't believe this. Mr. Perfect. The new Intercontinental Champion. So there you go. I mean, I would have loved to have seen that pay off. I'm a huge Mr. Perfect fan. I think most people listening to this probably are too. And the idea that we didn't really see it pay off is disappointing, but we did see something else start to bubble up when we saw stone cold watching on a monitor backstage with, as you mentioned, Teal Hopper and the loose cannon, Brian Pillman. And when Brett announced that at survivor series, he would be facing Steve Austin immediately. Brian Pillman started clapping and cheering and Austin gave him quite the go to hell. Look, we know that's going to pay off because, uh, we're going to see him attack Brian Pillman in the coming months and put hard times on him when he puts his, uh, fused ankle in a chair and jumps off the top rope on it. And then that leads to the whole home invasion. 
and boy, a new era of the WWF is here, but man, that was a, that was a quick raw, an hour long raw leaves you wanting more. Uh, nobody really probably says that these days after a three hour raw. And I think, rugged. I think lessons were learned on the nitro side of things, a three hour live show. It's just hard to keep your attention every single Monday, week in, week out. But this one hour show, this was pretty good, man. Yeah. It's kind of like a comparing, uh, uh, dynamite on Wednesday nights on TNT and, uh, rampage on Friday nights, that one hour show on Friday nights, seems like it just flies by. It does. And I think that, uh, the one hour format certainly still got its place. Uh, but two would be my absolute limit unless you're doing a pay-per-view If people are paying for more and you, and you get more with, uh, on a pay-per-view. So. You know, I, I know our next pay per view is going to be in Saint in uh, Minneapolis, so I say Saint Paul. Be there too, uh, Twin Cities, and uh, tickets are moving well. By the way, AEWTX dot com. Uh, but yeah, I think the one hour thing still works. I don't see Rampage going to two hours. I don't see any of Tony Khan's uh, over the air content ever going to three hours. But you know, who the hell knows for sure? But I, I would be surprised if that ever happened. I think we've all learned good lessons about these three hour Raws. <clears throat> it's not done for artistic benefit. It's done for the money. USA is paying a lot more, a lot more money for that, that third hour of primetime television that's live every week. So, uh, but to me, it's a little bit long. I had a hard time the other night watching the, uh, uh, Brady Belichick reunion. It's just the game just seemed like it went on forever. Yeah. And I sad to say as a football mark as I am, but it, the game got a little long for me toward the fourth quarter. Well, we hope we haven't gone too long for you today, but don't worry. We'll be back next week. Talking all things, no mercy, 2001. It's going to feature Steve Austin defending his WWF world title against Kurt angle and Rob Van Dam. It's Rob Van Dam's first main event for the WWF. Uh, Chris Jericho will be taking on the rock for the WCW title and the uh, program we've been waiting for really since Jericho's debut back in 99, the undertaker will be in there with Booker T we've got edge versus Christian in a ladder match and so much more. But in the meantime, you need to cruise over to jrsbbq.com. Come on over. If you haven't been checking out the all purpose seasoning, what are you waiting for? We plug it every week because I love it. But every time I log into social, Somebody else is bragging about the ketchup or the mustard, or of course, sauce it, baby. There's something for everybody at jrsbbq.com, right, Jim? Absolutely. And Conrad, we also have, uh, uh, copies of, uh, slobber knocker and under the black hat that <coughs> you go on, excuse me, you can go on our site and, uh, and, and order your copy. Well, and I'll personalize it. You have a little, there's a little box there. What you said, you tell me what you want me to say. <laughs> they make great gift ideas. So uh, something to think about as we get closer, a step every day, a step closer to the holidays and you're looking for books for a wrestling fan or looking for a gifts for a wrestling fan. We've also got gift boxes, uh, all kinds of good stuff. So uh, Stephen link does a great job. there managing that property. It's growing every day and, and we're proud and grateful for that. So jrsbbq.com, uh, think about us for your, for gift giving and think about how it's going to feel on your palate or as a. Uh, McMahon would say, as a mankind would stick his mandible claw down somebody's gullet. Did you ever use the term gullet in anything in your whole fucking life? I never did. Nope. I never said gullet before. Gullet. So we'll just let Vince have that, the, uh, the the franchise on that deal. Notwithstanding. Yeah. Well, it's all yours, baby. Well, listen, this has been fun. Uh, shove some JR's BBQ in your gullet at JR's We'll be back next week. Checking out no mercy. 2001. I want to mention if you'd like to advertise your product or service here on the program, we'd love to have your business and advertise with Conrad.com. And of course, who could forget adfreeshows.com? Jim, we've got more bonus content over there than we can shake a stick out. We've got some, uh, some old video. But you can do what? Oh, more than we can shake a stick at. Oh, that's not what you said. He says, oh. shake a stick out. Okay. You know what? Then you need to get your shit together and quit saying big show. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're right. Let me fucking go, Jim. Uh, 
<laughs> hey, we're having a lot of fun over here, and the fun continues on adfreeshows.com. We've got the old radio show from Atlanta. We've Ooh. got old car trips with you and Tony Schiavone on camera. Uh, and we've even got you watching some old UWF, some old Mid South action. There's something for everybody at adfreeshows.com, including all of our shows here early and ad free. Yeah. How did your uh, interview? I haven't watched it yet to be totally uh, honest. And, uh, with Jerry Jarrett go, I saw the highlights out on social and looked at very, very compelling. I'll make sure I get you a link. I think you're going to dig it. It's uh, going to be a two-parter, uh, but I don't think enough people really understand the historical significance for Memphis as a territory and more specifically, Jerry Jarrett as a promoter, you look at all the folks who went through his territory and they include, uh, a who's who yes. Ric yeah. Flair was there defending his world title against Jerry Lawler. Yes. Andre, the giant was there, but let's talk about early beginnings. He shot the first vignette of Hulk Hogan in 1979, 1979. They call him the Hulk that's in 79 right. and it happened in Jarrett's basement, but also the creation of Kamala. Uh, how about the rock cut his teeth in Memphis? Uh, of course, uh, stone cold, Steve Austin worked for Jerry Jarrett. Uh, what about the macho man? I mean, you could even go back to sting and the ultimate warrior, just one after another. Uh, it, it's all the legends of professional wrestling at one point or another came through his territory and we got to pick his brain in a special sit down interview conversations with Conrad. That's exclusively at adfreeshows.com. Yes. I, I, what I've seen, uh, the little snippets, uh, seem to really be entertaining. So, uh, and if you're a historical person, you like the history of wrestling and the traditions and, uh, and which I'd love, quite frankly, it's kind of what our show here is based on nostalgia and going back in time and, and reflecting on how, or where I was in that. And as a, as just cause it's great, it does say grilling with Jr. It should have a little, uh, you know, I enjoy the, the going back and remembering things. Like I remember that jacket today, that jacket was a, was an action figure. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know how they did that, but nonetheless, uh, it was kind of cool. So and that was a jacket. My little bride, Jen got me. So. It's, I don't even know where the hell that son of a bitch is. Who's that jacket? Isn't it funny how you lose shit? I, 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 I probably lost more memorabilia giving it away. I get, she used to give my hats away until she found out they cost a thousand a piece. And, uh, so I got busted on that deal. So don't, <laughs> but we didn't give me more, we didn't give me more hats away for a while. So anyhow, uh, I, I love, I think this year thing's going to be real good. And, and I still think that another one, I know you've got, you, we, you and I've talked about it unofficially. Uh, uh, sit down with cowboy because you haven't talked, you haven't done cowboy yet. Have you? No, sir. I have not. I think it's going to be, if you can get it done and I know you got to travel to him. He's lives up there in the Ozarks and all that stuff. Same basic kind of stories of all the different people, the cowboy started. And, and ironically, there's a connection with cowboy and Jerry Jarrett because we've made a big trade for them that I think we came out the better for it. Cause we got, you know, the midnight express was created by cowboy bill Watts. And, uh, and we got this guy, uh, bill Dundee to come in and book. It was great. Bill did a good job. So, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, and rock and roll came in for us. So I think a cowboy and Jerry have a lot in common in that regard. They, the, the bottom line is this, they both had great eyes for talent. And when you're a sponge like me, who just loves everything pro wrestling, in that era, when I was, you know, younger, getting into the ball, doing all these different things, uh, what an education. And I don't know that I quite appreciated as much then as I do now, how much I learned from guys like Jerry Jarrett and Bill Watts and so forth. And I always thought it unique. I'm sure you talked about with Jarrett that the fact that he would book the territory in Memphis for half a year and, and Lauder would book it for half a year. I always thought that was kind of interesting. Cause normally a booker, when he's the booker, you, it's like having a, a appointment to the Supreme court. You just, you got it for life, so to speak, especially when you own it. So I, I always thought that was good. So we, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that, uh, that interview and I, I, you, all, all the ones you've done have been great. This Jim Hurd stuff was great because you just get a different perspective of these dudes. So I think uh, nobody else is doing anything like this, but Conrad and I, you folks owe it to yourself, especially in the ad free network. That's the way to go anyway. Subscribe, join, play with us, come along. And, uh, I guarantee you won't be disappointed. 
And you won't be disappointed if you check out JR's work every Wednesday night on TNT. Uh, of course, we're only talking old things here. We love talking about the old, good old days of professional wrestling, but the voice of wrestling is still at it every Wednesday night on TNT. It's AEW Dynamite. Uh, until next week, he is at JR's BBQ. I am at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here for Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thanks, Conrad. Enjoy the show, folks. Hope you liked it as well. Tell your friends about it. Uh, drops every Thursday or earlier on the ad free network. So, uh, on behalf of my friend Conrad, my God, that pink shirt is titillizing. Can I see your nipples? <laughs> just one, just, just one nipple. Oh my God. All right, Conrad, enough Thanks, of this man. bullshit. Let's have a, have a great week folks. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Have I told you what I'm helping people with in my real life? Yeah. I'm helping them save money over at SaveWithConrad.com. If you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Go get yourself a quick quote. Interest rates have improved and people are realizing, Hey, now's a chance to save some cash. And I'm talking to you. If you're still on the fence about buying a house, we can get you out of that apartment. Tell your landlord to kiss your grits and get you into a brand new house. You can do that with 5% down with three and a half percent down. And yes, there are still no money down options available in 2024. Savewithconrad.com is your first step. We're going to ask you, Hey, where are you now? And where would you like to be? And we're going to get you on a path to fit those short term goals, but really meet the long term goal that we all want. And that's to appreciate the American dream. The American dream isn't to give 29% of your gross monthly income every month until you die to some banker. No, you want to own that thing for real, your own piece of land for you and your family, your legacy. And we want to help you get one for yourself at savewithconrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And maybe, maybe you've already got a house, but it'd be nice if you could pay a little less. We're routinely finding a way to help our podcast listeners combine all of their debt. And I mean, all of it, credit cards, personal loans, even car payments, get it into one low monthly payment. Not only is it a better interest rate, it's also a greater tax deduction, but maybe most importantly, a much cheaper payment. We're routinely helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. But how much can you save? Find out right now at savewithconrad.com. You guys, the housing market's really good right now, too. For you folks out there that are thinking of making a change uh, in your overhead or, or your living conditions, uh, now's not a bad time to make that move. Nowhere better to do it than savewithconrad.com. He's going to save you money. He's going to be honest. And it's like dealing with a friend, an educated friend. And boy, there's a lot of uneducated and unfriendly people in that world. Conrad Thompson is not one of them. Well, I appreciate you saying that, Jim. Check out our reviews online. You're going to see we've got more than a thousand five-star reviews. Customer service is what it's all about. We want to be your mortgage advisor for life. So there's no application fee. There's no credit report fee. We just want to talk, man. Hey, tell us where you are and tell us where you want to be. And we'll try to help you get a plan to get there. We want to be your advocate, your humble advocate at SaveWithConrad.com. Attaboy, Connie. Look at those cheeks, ladies. Look at those cheeks, ladies and gentlemen. My God. How could you say no to that, right? NMLS number 2129, Equal Housing Lender. Savewithconrad.com.